thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I like to go to conferences with different communities, and I think you can learn from each other much better than going to the same place with the same people again and again. And there is some interesting connections between neutrino physics and nuclear physics. And apologies to the whole audience for being the only obstacle between now and lunch, which is to the 50, or 15 minutes ago, <laughs> but blame it on others. So I'm talking about the uh, CONUS experiment uh, aiming at coherent neutrino uh, nucleus scattering. Coherent neutrino nucleus scattering is one of the six type of interactions that's been predicted a long time ago, but it's never been observed so far. And you might say, why do you go care for it? Because it should be there, it's obvious, etc. Of course, it is conceptually important, so it should be detected. But I will argue that it will be soon turned into a useful method to test new physics. So from not being observable, it will turn into something being the workhorse for some new type of physics. That's the punchline of this talk in the end of the day. Coherent neutrino scattering goes with a, a neutral current here. The nucleus recalls as a whole, and the coherence is up to something like 50 MeV when the wavelength of the process is sees the whole nucleus and not a single, single neutron or proton. The process is proportional to this weak charge, which goes with n, the number of neutrons, minus 1, minus 4 sine squared theta w, the, the, the protons. So since the w, uh, sine squared w is about 0.23 or so, this is all cancelling off, essentially, the neutral number, you see. This also means that you are very sensitive to the Weinberg angle once you get a certain precision in this measurement. The cross-section then is proportional to some constants here, then the discharge squared, which means you get an n squared. There's some kinematical factors, and there's a form factor squared, which gets interesting once you go to energies close to the coherence. A simple exercise tells you if you take, let's say, germanium, n equals 40, then n squared is 1,600, which means that a 10-ton detector is then a kilogram type thing. A kiloton is hundreds of kilograms. So when you're used to kiloton type detector in neutrino physics, you should be listening because that's really changing things a lot. Important is, of course, the coherence length. It's proportional to one of the energy. So you need neutrinos below 50 MeV for typical nuclei. So you can't just go to high and higher energy. And of course, as you go to low energy, the cross-section also is lower. So you have to balance off with flux at the end of the day. Let's have a look at the usual neutrino spectrum. That's the usual plot where you see the energy and the flux. Of course, the flux is high there, but you have to fold this with the cross-section. So it's not clear. It has a certain slope in here what wins. Shown also here is the uh, reactor neutrinos. That's for 10 gigawatts at a distance of 150 kilometer, kilometers. That's the Kamlan situation. And of course, you can beat that by going to a closer, closer to a power reactor. And about 4% of the thermal power of a nuclear power reactor blown out in antineutrinos. It's quite a lot of energy. If you have, for example, a 3.9 gigawatt reactor that we'll talk in a moment about, that's 150 megawatts in neutrinos. So waste of energy. So the Greens should say you should do, should do something about this, etc. And of course, there's the dilution by distance. But when you, go to, when you go to a 10 meters distance of such a reactor, there's 150 kilowatts per square meter. So when you go there and have been there, it makes you really feel different. If you've ever had a doubt that there's ghostly parting in dark sectors, that's the place to go, because it's really impressive. 150 kilowatts, 100 cooking stoves at full power. If it would be light, it would just evaporate. So of course, the neutrino cross-section shouldn't be forgotten. That has to be folded in. And so when you have, let's say, you go up here in the, in the flux here, that's good. The other way to go up here is, of course, with somewhat higher energy, we stop pion beams, which I'll show you a little bit in a second. And of course, uh, that, then you have two options to go. Going to higher energy doesn't help you because you lose coherence. You have to stay at this low energy regime, when, let's say, for reactors or, or, or beams with low energy. That's what, what the message is. There's some other sources here, and you can discuss later on if you see a supernova and things like that. Of course, it's interesting side routes. So there are two paths. One, and that's uh, going to be covered in the talk by Kate Schultberg, is to use uh, a low energy neutrino beam from decay addressed, uh, pile decay addressed. There are different flavors then, and there's a, a, a relatively high recall energy. So here you see the spectrum from muon neutrinos, electron uh, neutrinos, uh, etc. So it ranges up all the way to 50 MeV in the area where there is decoherence sets in. We have to talk about form factors. This is the part which is in the coherent part, uh, and you have to uh, look at this once you have enough statistics. The reactors have low energies. The energies extend up to a few MeV, so the reactors are fully in a fully coherent regime. That's the uh, two sources you can go. And of course, you have heard probably that just recently the coherent experiment has detected coherent neutrino scattering. 
by having, uh, they have four different detectors they use. Uh, uh, they have a, a source which is uh, the, the SNS source, which is a flux of 4.3 times 10 to 7 neutrinos per square centimeter second. So it's much lower than the numbers I showed you, but the energy is higher when you do the product, and of course you can see it. They have now a certain uh, data on tape uh, and then re analyze this uh, cesium iodide crystals and they have 6.7 sigma for an excess which is shown here and it's just by the eye that the effect is there and I guess they'll show more in the next, over the next year or so and Kate, Kate Schulberg will cover this in detail in the talk. So coherence capping has been seen in his pyron decay at rest experiments. Why do you care for more? I'll uh, tell you that having different energies helps and also different flavor compositions help and of course statistics help in the future. That's where the starting point is of the CONUS experiment. The idea was, and that's about a year ago when we actually started thinking about this, if it's possible, you can combine the highest neutrino flux, so you go close to a power reactor, take the lowest detection threshold, germanium detectors with low threshold, that was R&D, that was successful, and take the best background suppression, that's something that goes under the virtual depth and explain what this means. Once you combine these three elements, you find that you're in business, and that was the starting point of the coherent neutrino scattering experiment collaboration with just a handful of people, and there's two institutes, and the second institute actually is two physicists at the reactor site that work with us, give us all the details that you dream of when you, when you want to work on such an experiment, and that, that's it. It makes so much fun to work in a small group and, and move in this, in this speed compared to uh, hundreds of people. So the experimental requirement is to measure nuclear recoil energy T, and the maximum recoil energy is given by the energy of the neutrino and the, and the n and, and the number of neutrons and protons and nucleus like this. So for 10 MeV, you get a maximum recoil of 3 kV in germanium. So you have to have a throw threshold that's low enough. In addition, you have to take into account the energy loss to the quenching. So your neutrino deposits energy, but with the readout is not what's been deposited as a quenching factor. As quenching factors have been measured over certain energies with, uh, with certain uncertainties. And this quenching factor down to this regime where we talk about is 0.2, but it has a considerable uncertainty between 0.15 and 0.25 or something like that. But future measurements of this quenching factor down there will help a lot and are of immediate value to make this data better. The situation then looks as follows. If whatever your setting is, you have some background as a function of energy, there's some background here, there may be some higher background at lowest energies. This line here is your coherent neutrino scattering signal, and the red line is a threshold. You don't care what's happening on the left side. Uh, you have to make sure that the background here is deep enough and the signal is high enough so you see it sticking out of, of, of your setup. So you need a high neutrino flux to make that line signal go up. You need a low threshold and to uh, keep the background low here. And by keep the background low means to have to use radio pure materials. I'll tell you more about this in a second. Very clean materials and this virtual depth shielding technology. And then you can uh, so start thinking about this. So we put some numbers together, which we thought and actually matched and oh, that could be realistic. So take a one kilogram neutrino detector, not a kiloton, it's a kilogram again, BGSH type, it's a germanium diode, you instrument it with an amplifier and high voltage as usual, etc. I think you yeah, can go to distance of 15 meters to 3.9 gigawatt, and then the flux is this number here, and the background assume is one per kilogram per kV per day. Then you get this table here, where the three numbers mean the signal events per year, the background events per year, and the signal to background. If you look at this pulse or threshold table here, that's one unknown, a technological unknown at the time, you could think that these central numbers here are quite realistic, and I can tell you that's been achieved. That's the idea. It's, get, it's actually getting better up there. The quenching factor, the best fit here, worst and best case, so say you can see. And if you go here in the central part, that's for the best fit, or even for the better numbers, you're talking about thousands of, thousands of events per kilogram a year. That's what the ballpark you are. You talk about the background is low, and the signal to background here is 13, 44, numbers like that. So it's really getting to a point where detection is not, not, not really, really uh, something you can think about. It's non-trivial uh, to achieve these numbers, but it's doable on a short time scale was the conclusion. And even a one kilogram detector can detect coherent neutrino scattering pretty fast. And then of course you can think of upscaling this to larger detectors because going from one kilogram to a bunch of kilograms is not that difficult. Here you see the same statement in a differential way, the background here, the event rate, and of course the lower the threshold is the more things stick out. That's the message here. So then we started, and uh, the first thing is to find a suitable source. We were lucky we found, uh, we got access to the Proctor of Mutter power plant in Germany, it's north of Hamburg. This is a picture here, and we had a quite unique location, this red spot here. This is actually the reactor, 
This is the water basin, and they've used spent fuel on top of there, which is not a problem because the, take, uh, the energies are low. So they went below all this water, which acts to shielding, and they're in a distance that's uh, 16 point something meters, close to 17 meters away from the center of the reactor. Uh, the reactor has 3.9 gigawatts total power, so that's the neutrino flux, 10 to the 14 neutrinos per square centimeter second. That's 50 kilowatt per square meter in neutrinos. And the reactor is, is actually known as the one in the world that has the highest duty cycle, keeps running at a, uh, almost all the time. So if you integrate, it's the most intense neutrino flux I know. I don't know any other experiment that's in a place that has a higher neutrino flux than this place here. And it's up to 8 MeV and fully coherent. You use, of course, the usual, let's say, knowledge about what the reactor neutrino spectrum is, and you can also work backwards later on when you have enough data to uh, get it better constrained. And one unique thing is you have access during operation. You really can go there and work during the reactor running. It's quite some feeling when you're there, and you know that over there where the wall is, there's a four giga, close to four gigawatt reactor that's supplying all of Hamburg with electricity. The overburden of all that concrete and water here is something that 10 to 45 meters water equivalent, depending on which direction you look, that's good. You have also measurements of the neutron background, I'll say a little bit more later. And of course, reactors have on-off periods, which means when the reactor is off with good statistics, you can actually measure the background. You can make sure that you see a reactor going on and off to be sure that you know what you're talking about. So the first is the next thing is the shielding. This was actually a side product out of our uh, screening activities. We have in Heidelberg, uh, in our basement, detectors which have sensitivities of about one millibecker per kilogram of uranium thorium. In Grand Sass, we operate the world's best detectors, which have about 10 microbecker per kilogram. And in this gap, it was a, a problem because we had to send things to Grand Sass, which we didn't need to send. So we developed this detector to have in our shallow lab something in between. It's a small detector. It's a very really pure assay here with the shielding itself. It's uh, lead and copper against uh, the external radioactivity. It has layers of braided polyethylene to capture, a mod, mo, uh, capture moderate neutrons. And it has uh, quite interesting an active veto, special active veto, which couples those plastic scintillators, which both vetoes muons and other things in this, uh, inside this detector. You can summarize this inside this detector is as if it would be a few hundred meters deeper. You could do something like a Heidelberg Moscow experiment now with such a shielding in our basement. And this shows it in numbers here. This, for example, the gamma and taxona, the depth, the muon flux, which you reduce only mildly because muons go through, and that's the background rate of chief. And you see this shallow depth here is better than, than all those detectors because it actually, actually does what you, what you do. That's why I term this term virtual depth. It's something like if this detector would be a few hundred meters deep. It means also then that something where you can do an experiment close to the surface where you need the shielding, and the reactor, of course, is on the surface, and that's why you can use that kind of thing. That was then the basis for the Kronos shield, which is very similar. You have, again, layers of uh, different materials. There's matryoshka back then. There's an inner layer of lead, which suppresses muon into a uh, the continuum. There's very careful material selection, so we did a lot of screening and, and material selection. And we did testing in our low-level lab, lab to compare this shield with the uh, Jova shield, etc., to make sure that we understand what's going on and have a very clean setup, because you couldn't do that at the reactor site. The detectors are low background, low threshold germanium detectors. That's coming out of the GERA involvement in our group and the BGR and DVD on top of that. We have some detectors called Asterix and Obelix where we did some changes and tests, etc. And then at the end, there's kilogram size SAGE detectors, which are no longer cooled with liquid nitrogen like in the old days. They're cooled with uh, PT coolers, electrical power PT coolers, which has two advantages. First of all, you can adjust the temperature a little bit in a certain range, which means you can choose the optimal temperature for the operation of this germanium crystal, lower than liquid nitrogen. And of course, operating a nuclear power plant, you shouldn't go, uh, fumble around with liquid nitrogen. They don't like that. This only needs a power plug, and there's lots of power at the nuclear power side. The positive resolution was in this range here, and thresholds in this, in this, uh, this area. And we decided then to go for four kilogram, four one kilogram detectors. That's some drawing, and that's the real thing in, in its copper housing. That's then the Conus detector as it looks towards the end. There's all these components, this matryoshka type shielding inside the germanium detectors, outside the PT colors. And we can say we successfully combined these three things that are necessary to get this done. The start of the project was summer 2016, and data taking starts still in 2017. In fact, this week, the detector's moving to its place, etc. And it's unfortunately, we were delayed by six months because the reactor had an unexpected stop by for six months that wasn't scheduled originally. So 
if that stuff hadn't happened, we would be further, uh, further advanced in time. We had, I'd hope to have some results up by summer, but that's how life goes. That's uh, one picture of two detectors in the shielding with the upper part missing. You see how it looks. There's these layers of, of different materials. There's lead here, there's sporated polyethylene, uh, there's, uh, there's copper, etc., and in different layers. And this is optimized to sandwich to make sure that the background inside is optimal. And I'll show you some Monte Carlo numbers in a moment in those of measurements. This is, again, this detector, this is the full thing. It's in a metal shield box, so say, sealed completely for two reasons. The first one is the new safety in the power plant. We have to be earthquake proof, even though there was never, ever any earthquake evidence in this place up there close to the North Sea. But still, they want us to be earthquake proof. That's why there's this damping system, etc. But the other point is, they see these little hoses here. The ceiling is good. We can flush this detector with clean nitrogen to make sure that radon is not a problem inside the detector, which radon is usually everywhere a problem. So it's, it's good, good in certain sense. So that's a, a simulation, so to say, of the muon, no, the measurement of the muon induced background in the, corner, in the shields. The red one is this, uh, the black one is this GOV detector that we have. Next to it, we put the other detector and put a, uh, another germanium detector that we had while the, the real detectors were, were built in it. And you can see it works. So, so we use more lead, etc. in the inner side. Lead, uh, experts know, has more bent shalom than copper, uh, proportional Z squared. But lead has a better self shielding, so in total, you get a low counter at low energies. And you see it here by using more lead to the inner side. The Monte Carlo simulations tell us if this Matrushka is a little bit better for this purpose than the other one. And here you see the same statement in number. So, this, this Monte Carlo optimizations that we did before actually just con were confirmed with this kind of measurements. Also, well, Muon Vito uh, performs nicely. There's a 99% uh, efficiency in it. There's almost no low line background left and uh, of any radioactive contaminant. And the reach of interest, we achieve less than one per event per kilogram a day in KV. That was the design goal. So the design parameters have been matched. Here again, you see numbers. And you see that this uh, Conrad is the shielding we built with this temporary germanium detector actually passes, so say, what, 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 has, what, what has been done. The conus detectors are even better, so they should be even lower than in the background rate. So this virtual depth works for the shielding as well. The neutron background is something about the worry. A reactor has enormous neutron flow. And one of the exercises to do is that a few meters of steel and concrete absorb neutrons completely. In fact, inside this reactor site, the neutron flux is lower than outside of the meadows. It's just a really it's impressive how concrete sh uh, shields it. But of course, you have to worry about this. There's two backgrounds. One is cosmic gray background. There is all the reactor material, the water bases that shield you, and it's active veto, and we tested this, etc. So there's some, uh, there's a little bit more overburden than MPIK. So similar conditions, and this is understood both for measurements and Monte Carlo. Then the reactor, so say, we, to be sure, we had a measurement with a PTP Braunschweig, the German National Meteorology Institute with phonospheres, to measure during the winter the neutron flux. And it was lucky because there was a storm on the North Sea, and the storm on the North Sea means there's a lot of wind power produced, and they lower the power production in the reactor site. So we see the variation in the background measurements, or, or not the variation. We have actually a unique situation that they change the power in the reactor, and they can see how it changes the neutron flux, which is quite valuable. There was a Monte Carlo simulations, etc., and the outcome is mostly some thermal neutrons arrive in the place where the experiment sits, and the thermal neutrons are very well shielded by our, our shielding. So uh, there's, so to say, uh, the only thing left is only muon-induced neutrons in lead, which are so to say consistent with all our simulations and expectations. So this shield and the neutron situation uh, do work. Of course, while this is being built, and uh, you should expect results over the next year or so. We also think forward, and uh, once you see these numbers, you immediately start thinking about something like a 100 kilogram type detector. You do the upscaling, and you find this is a very interesting potential. So assume 100 kilogram, again, something 4 gigawatt at 50 meters, this is a flux, again, the same background, and do your, let's say, a calculation. Again, you have the poser as, uh, as parameter. I think you can expect something down here in the next years, kilogram type detectors down here, uh, 3 kilogram detectors like here, I would say. And you can measure the quenching factor best fit, and you can expect that the quenching factor gets measured much better than it's known nowadays. So somewhere in this table, I would say somewhere here on this side, that's where you probably could end up on the realistic assumptions, which means that this delta S over S, the ratio of uh, delta S over S single is about 10 to minus 3 to 10, even below 10 to minus 3. It's quite good statistics at the end of the day that you can expect. Signal to background numbers are uh, impressive. And of course, you can think of also a few hundred kilograms if you want. 
So that means that Korean neutrino scattering becomes a tool for other topics because that will be high statistics experiments. I hope so, yeah, I don't know. Oh, so. I mean, a lot, uh, okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So first of all, there's a dark matter connection. Dark matter experiments assume coherent scattering. We, of course, believe it's there, but it's nice to have one situation where you can test in detail loose neutrinos instead of WIMPs. Uh, there's this neutrino force study, so understanding things, I think understanding coherent scattering better is useful for, the, for, for dark matter searches, in, for example, in the form of WIMPs. You can also search for other things, for example, neutrino magnetic moments. Neutrino magnetic moments in the minimum neutrino mass scenario are very tiny. These numbers here in Dirac and Majorana case doesn't make much of a difference, they're tiny. But once you have new physics, then you can aim for detectable enhancements due to new, new, new physics in supersymmetry X dimensions and be my guest, etc. And uh, you, uh, at least you would get better limits than the current limits, etc. And that's what's shown here. There's the uh, weak contribution here. And that's the magnetic moment contribution exceeding the weak part at low energies, showing again how important it is at low threshold to see if there's enhancement on, on, the, on the lower recoil energy side. And if you can do that, you certainly can push the limits for magnetic moments uh, at, at least. This is the potential, this is the present limit at the moment, and if you shown here some scenarios, when you, when you go, for example, into a few hundred kilogram year data between yellow and green here, you're between yellow and green, and if you get the threshold down in this area, it would be here, so you can expect at least an order of magnitude improvement in the magnetic moment limits from that, or even or a signal is there. You can also search for new physics, so-called NSI operators, non-standard reactions. NSIs parameterize some new physics that may show up in our world via neutrinos by integrating out the heavy stuff. So you essentially get a full Fermi operator from a Z prime, new scalars, whatever, and you call this parameter epsilon ij, epsilon ij, and normalize to the strength of the Fermi constant. So it's a full Fermi operator normalized to the Fermi, Fermi constant strength. So no wonder these epsilons are tiny, and epsilons are mw squared over m nu, nu scale squared. So if the new scale is TeV, you expect 100 TeV over 1 TeV squared, so you expect epsilon to be at the percent level. A TeV effect is a percent effect. If you go higher, then epsilon gets sm smaller. So you want to look for tiny epsilons, so that's how the cross-section looks with all these epsilons there. Now, the, oops. So as the plot is missing for a good reason. Okay, this plot, if it were there, would show you the potential of NSI operators for a 100 kilogram detector, five years of operation, and the plot shows actually three things. First, it shows your current limits. It shows you that the Dune experiment is improving these current limits somewhat, and this 100 kilogram experiment would beat Dune for these NSI operators. So a 100 kilogram experiment can, be, can do better than Dune in this kind of thing. And again, here is the scale, the center scale sensitivity, so it would have limits somewhere out. Don't know what happened to this plot, why it disappeared. So you can really have, depending on the channel, you can have quite sensitive statements on, on, on high-scale physics that would show up via these NSI operators. Uh, precision measurements, this is Kate's slide. Sorry, Kate, I just took it and adopted it, so that's your slide, which I guess you may show it again. A precision measurement of the Weinberg angle of low energy is possible. What's important is if you take this PSM sensitivity, let's say 10 to 3 or 10 to minus 4, and you can translate it in a delta sign squared Weinberg angle, and you can put it on this plot, and you, it's quite an exciting measurement you can think of. So that's why I think it's important to, uh, uh, to, to follow this line. I think it would be a very competitive measurement of the Weinberg angle of low energies constraining then extra dimensions on other things that people talk about or, or finding something. There's also search for the physics. You can look for stereo neutrinos because time is running out. I'm brief. You can either have one detector and very precise information about the reactor or, or two half detectors and uh, to look for more than one of our square deviations. And that's by these guys here, a study where they showed how you can, let's say, go for electrical type stereo neutrinos. The point there is, of course, there's a number of experiments running these days by the time you build a detector, this may be settled and you may, may, may be less interesting, but it's something you can do. And of course, depending on what we know until then, that would define how, what kind of detector could be interesting. There's a, a connection to nuclear physics uh, with queer scattering because you're really, by combining mev measurements, the multi uh, mev measurements from stop pion beams with uh, reactor experiments and different channels, you can start talking about nuclear form factors. In other words, seeing a nucleus in the light of neutrinos. And that's, I think, something that's happening. It's not going to be tremendous statistics to begin with, but that's really uh, uh, something that, that will happen. And combining the, the pion decay at rest measurements with the reactor measurement will be 
are very powerful because they have not only normalization, also have the difference between the normalizations. That's going to be an interesting uh, field for people interested in connections to nuclear physics. Last but not least, you can do nuclear safeguarding. If you have, uh, there's a so-called plutonium breeder blanket here in a uh, slide from Patrick Huber, which is below the inverse beta decay detection, so you won't see it, and usually double uranium diabate have detectors. But with these kind of detectors, you can see it, and you'll see a difference in the spectrum if you have a low enough threshold, etc. And that's, of course, interesting. It has two routes. It's interesting to the International Atomic Energy Union because of surveillance, monitoring reactors, uh, people, countries that have signed the test span treaty, etc., the reactor uh, production. And also you could use it as an extra sensor in reactors. If you build such a detector, which I've shown you, closer to a new reactor, let's say a few meters, five meters, four meters away, then you have such high statistics that you can use it to really measure the neutrino flux to do safe, extra safety arguments, but you can also optimize the burn-up of the nuclear fuel. And I tell you, if you squeeze out 1% more energy out of these fuel rods, it's paying 100 times for this kind of extra addition. So it's really at the verge of neutrino technology, that, if you think about that. And I wonder what Pauli would say if he hear me talk about neutrino technology with a kilogram type detector. So my summary, coherent neutrino scattering has recently been observed by coherent, and Kate will give you all the details in a, in a very nice talk that I look forward to. That's the high energy part. Conus will see the uh, coherent scattering in the not too distant future with MEV type neutrinos. And of course, uh, uh, that's here, uh, data taking is still uh, starting in 2017, etc. cetera, and others will see. And then uh, you can see it in different ways and start putting it together, put limits on this and that, maybe discuss all sort of connections. But it's also my point that coherent neutrino nucleus scattering is at the verge of an in become an interesting tool. The technology to do that exists. It's just the upscaling is nothing but taking existing technology to a larger detector size. And when you do that, then you can only can talk all these topics. So there is a new door to, to open and to discuss about uh, physics in a way that hasn't been done. So there's a very interesting potential of coherent neutrino scattering in the next years to come. Thank you for your patience.